You're listening to Big World Network. Road Home, Episode 1, written and read by Lee Lincoln. Freedom. Why was everyone always striving to achieve freedom? You know, after so many years of searching, I finally thought I knew what freedom was. But I couldn't understand why so many people claimed it was so wonderful. The whole idea of chasing after that dream no longer made any sense to me. Dreams as a whole didn't make any sense to me. Since quitting my job, well, more like running away from it, I'd wandered across the country from one coast to the other. Didn't matter where I went, things still looked the same. Bleak, miserable, lonely. Not being bound to any clock or responsibility would have been liberating to most, but nothing could satisfy my deep longing within. You know that feeling? When you know you're empty but nothing seems to fill the void? That was my constant companion. To be honest, freedom wasn't all that it should have been. In fact, sometimes I seemed more chained than I ever had been before. For me, sitting and crying made more sense than running, because I didn't know what I was longing for. How could I ever hope to find something I couldn't even name? Darn, the coffee was cold. Feeling the iciness of the ceramic mug against my skin as I cradled it in my hands matched my mood. How long had I been sitting here stirring it, without even once bringing it to my lips to take a sip? Doesn't matter, Cindy. The coffee was the price of admission. I sat there in my almost clean, best-patched jeans, my not-so-holy blouse, my never-make-the-cover-of-Cosmo's shaggy long haircut, and my ragged, chewed manicure. I could only imagine what those around me must have been thinking. Look at that oddball. Why doesn't someone tell the poor fool that homeless people are not wanted? Find a job. In the past few years, I'd heard all of that plenty of times, and so much worse. If only they knew me. If only they knew my story. But even then, it wouldn't change their opinion of me. No, it would only make me even lower in someone's eyes. If they could see beneath the homeless exterior I'd shown the world for so long now, it would be their turn to run. That was a mask that was now fused onto me, a part of me, and I had no plans to ever take it off again. I looked around the Mama Pop Cafe in that small town in eastern Pennsylvania on yet another cold spring evening. I could spy only a few customers. These good folks had been looking at me in curiosity off and on, trying not to stare but failing. I could feel their eyes on me every second. You learn to ignore it when you're in my position, but it still sometimes makes your skin crawl, makes you want to climb into the nearest hole. You must fight that feeling and go on. These people may give you a slice of bread when you need it the most. Then again, they more than likely wouldn't. The tables in the cafe dingy, the padded benches patched, the flowered wallpaper faded from the sun, the food served generous proportions. Was that why customers kept coming back? When your stomach gurgles at the mere thought of food, you know you need to keep your mind on something else. Before the hunger overwhelmed me, I put my chin in my hands, my elbows resting on the table, trying to imagine why there was a lack of customers here today in this nice little spot, I peeped around again. My guess was that it had more to do with the downpour, which had continued all day, than anything else. Everything outside was soggy and wet. The packed dirt parking lot was fast becoming a swamp, yet in here was cozy. Returning the stares of those around me, I got a good look at my fellow diners. Most of those huddled at the tables around me were middle class, dressed in button-down shirts and ties or slacks and blouses. Singles whether for dinner or life, I couldn't say. Those were the people who mostly looked down on the homeless. 
they knew they were only one paycheck away from being there themselves. You hear so many sob stories over the years from people like them. You become almost immune to the horrors of it all after a while. They all swore that they never thought homelessness could happen to them. Yet they'd slipped through the cracks onto the street with such ease. For me, there was no slipping. I jumped headfirst into this life, fully believing that this was better than anything else I'd lived through. Hard to say if I was right or wrong on that score. Forget the people. Forget the stairs. Back to daydreaming. When was life better for you, Cindy, I thought. When were things sort of okay? College. Now those were the good days. Barely working. Barely studying. Enjoying those last few years before officially becoming an adult. I was sort of out from under the heavy hand of my father, but not yet under the thumb of my husband. Funny how so many of my classmates stated that they'd love to go back to the era of the 60s. You know, drop out of life, become hippies and hang out, forever living like kids who never would have to grow up. They all only wanted to be free. When you're 18, nothing seems out of reach. Nothing's impossible. The whole world is a glorious unknown just waiting to be explored. My classmates wanted to know what it was like not to be bound to that rat race forever. Their poor, unfortunate parents were slaves to their jobs, their mortgages, their car payments, their social standings. We didn't want to be like that. It would have been nice to stay in that simple, pre-adult state forever when life was happy, carefree, unburdened. College encouraged that sense of freedom. So many professors never caring if you showed up, nobody watching to see when you finally got to bed, or even if you ever did. Usually someone else was paying the bills. There were parties to attend, games to be played, dances to be danced, boys to be kissed, games to cheer at, movies to go to dressed in costume, nights where you'd lay out in the grass of the quad watching the stars with fifty other people, life to be lived with wild abandon, never caring what happened next. You were there to enjoy every moment as if it was your last. That was life at eighteen. But it all was an illusion, nothing but a lie. Those kids didn't understand what a heavy burden living life was. I'd already lived more life by college than most people did in a lifetime, and none of it was good. And now I'd seen so much more, gone further than I ever should have gone, and couldn't go back even if I wanted to. What were the words to that old song? Yes, I remember now. Freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. Yes, that was what freedom was. I'd found that out the hard way. Over the course of many wasted years and many miles of wasted traveling with no purpose, I'd learned so much. A lesson that no one should ever learn. Freedom. Honey, the rather large, plump, older waitress stood by my table. Dull, dirty blonde hair was pulled back haphazardly in a loose bun. Her brown uniform was stained with grease and grime. She wore a tan apron with pens and pads sticking out from pockets at odd angles. Still, she looked better than I did, though that wasn't saying much. I guess I'd overstayed my welcome. Should have seen that coming, since I was enjoying the comfy, albeit worn, bench for so long. The warmth of being indoors was so nice, so much so that it had been easy to not notice that time. What? My loud, rather curt voice shot back as I gripped the table so tightly my knuckles turned white. I almost wanted a scene. Letting everyone know I was more than a homeless person seemed important at that instant. Someone with feelings and needs that had to be met. Someone who honestly knew that she didn't have anything left to lose, including the dignity and pride that she sometimes felt she never had in the first place. Everything okay? You've been hunkered over that cup of joe for hours now. But as far as I can tell, you ain't hardly touched it. I'm a good listener, if and you's want to talk. She kept nodding her head like a bobble-headed doll and wringing her hands. Huh, 
wonder if she was afraid to approach me. She seemed nervous enough, despite her warm words. Trust me, you don't want to hear my story. Too long and uninteresting. How much do I owe you for the coffee? Hoping it wasn't much, since I only had about a dollar in my pocket, I had to ask anyway. You never can take anything for granted in this life. I should know. Oh, nothing, honey. She's on the house. If and you want to come back and talk, I'm here till nine. Not like we's really busy here. She cocked her head, giving me a concerned smile as she waved her hand around to show the lack of customers in the room. Thank you for the coffee. Gathering up my rather dirty, worn coat and tattered umbrella, I stood up. With her hands now firmly planted on her ample hips, she'd become a wall standing in my way. I was tempted to climb over the back of the bench, make a bigger scene than I already had. Careful not to bump into her since she was standing so close to the small table, I did a little sidestep instead. The look on her lined face was priceless, a sad puppy dog face like she cared what my problems could be. You shouldn't care about strangers. You don't know what kind of can of worms you might be opening. You might be getting the worst surprise of your life. You might be getting me. I'm no angel. I looked outside. It was still raining and getting dark fast. However, that wasn't half as depressing as the look on that waitress's face. I couldn't explain why it bothered me so much. Usually, I didn't care what others thought about me. It just did. It was like I was walking out on the only true friend I'd ever had, would ever have, which was ridiculous because I knew nothing about her and wasn't sure I wanted to. And besides, she knew nothing about me. Once anyone ever did, well, they would never want to be my friend or even be around me for long. After all these years, the freak image was still intact. The unlovable freak, that's me. I'd learned long ago who I was, and it wasn't a pretty sight. Ugly ain't only on the outside. You know it's true. As my hand hit the door handle, I heard her whisper, God bless you, honey. He cares. He truly does. Then I stepped out into the rainy evening, shivering, as a sudden burst of cold hit me. Pulling on my coat and picking up my well-used pack I'd left just outside the door, I began to wish I still had my car. When I'd begun this never-ending, seemingly pointless journey, I had an old Toyota, but it had long since died at this stage. That car was a tribute to its manufacturers. It had almost 300,000 miles on it, with few repairs done before it gave up the ghost. Finally, the transmission had given out. No way I could have afforded to repair something so major. Even at that point, so early in my wanderings, I was having a hard time finding enough odd jobs to pay for gas, as well as food. You know, some things are more important than others, and food has to be at the top of that list. So I'd sold the car somewhere in Oklahoma, I think, although I wasn't sure exactly when and where. The days had become so blurred together, especially lately couldn't seem to remember even the simplest things. Those details were in my journals, like many other now pointless facts. Did anyone care if I'd been to Tulsa or Tacoma or Tallahassee? Did I? Most days I didn't mind the endless walking off and did, or camping out for days without end. But when the weather was bad, I missed having shelter, any shelter. When you have no home, you look at things in a much different light. Sure, hail could dent a car, but it could also kill you. You learn to seek shelter in the oddest of places. A car provided adequate protection from the elements, so it was ideal. A car was much safer and warmer than a tent. But what if you didn't have a car? Well, then you had to be thankful for a tent if you had one. Or thankful for a tree if that's all you got. Or you snuggle up to a dryer vent, that's the best you can do. Grateful if it pumps out hot air once in the night. Anything to keep going one more day. Today was one of those bad days, damp and dreary. Finding a campsite before I became soaked and it got to be pitch black needed to be a priority. I almost turned around to re-enter the cafe to ask for directions. But that would mean facing that waitress again. And you're not doing that, Cindy. 
she'd want your life story. It was never fun to pitch a tent in an unfamiliar place in the dark. Being wet to the bone on top of it, well, that just meant setting myself up for one uncomfortable night. My nights were miserable enough with just my morbid thoughts as company. No point making things worse by being foolish. Shaking off my thoughts with an all-over body shudder, I began to walk up the road as I always did, placing one foot in front of the other. Splash, splash, splash. I walked through the puddles. Too bad there were no dry socks waiting for me at the end of this march. Or heater. Want to know an ideal way to spend your rainy spring evening? Walk for about half an hour with an umbrella that leaks. Scout for possible campsites while water is running down your back. Curse your rotten luck that you ended up exiling yourself to a life like this. Bring a date, a bottle of wine. Try to light a candle. You'll have a grand time. I should know. I did all those things often enough, and tonight was no exception. Freedom was so wonderful sometimes. You'll see. Give it a try. Or better yet, stay chained to your mortgage in your snug, dry house. The place I found was about a half a mile off the highway. In the dim light, it was hard to make out. I had almost missed it. I would learned to never camp too close to the road where I could be spotted easily by cops. Couldn't be too careful around cops. Some were good and would give you help. Others would escort you across the county line and ask you to never return. No, cops weren't people to be trusted unless there was no other option. But I also didn't want to be too far from the road that I couldn't get help if I needed it. Just one of the many little rules of survival that it served me well. The ground was almost dry under the shelter of the trees. Setting up my pup tent was easy. It's not like I hadn't done it a million times before. My hands could put up that tent without me even looking at what I was doing. The tent was my closest ally. But even it would let me down some day. My last one had and I'd replaced it without a thought. Well, some thought was involved. It wasn't like I walked around with a lot of spare change and could replace a tent at the drop of the hat. No, a great deal of hard work had been involved before I could move on with a new tent, and I'd hated every moment that it had cost me. Yet another meager dinner of stale bread and the last square of an old chocolate bar that had turned white. Someone had given me the bread at few days ago after I did some yard work for them. It was stale the moment they handed it to me. Those are the days when you should fight back, when you should say you are worth more than a worthless scrap that they were going to throw away anyways. But you don't, because you know you won't have anything to eat if you say anything. Something is better than nothing is your motto. So there I sat in my tent, in my wet clothes, eating garbage in my misery again. With a sigh, I settled down with my current notebook to record the day's events. Most days, I simply wrote a word or two about where I was and who I'd met. Lately, not even that. Yet another failure in my life. My mind began to wander again over the many years and miles this trek had taken me. Pictures began to form. Tears came unbidden and flowed down my cheeks staining the front of my shirt. How many homeless shelters and soup kitchens have you seen? How many times have you picked up odd jobs from nice people along the way for a meal or a little cash, or even the not-so-nice for a few rude remarks? How often have you slept in a bed without sheets because it was the only bed available? How many times have you pitched this tiny pup tent, or for that matter just slept under the stars? But, Cindy, you have freedom. My most valued possessions were my notebooks, my journals. I had one for each of my ten years on the road. They were small, and I wrote in tiny script. Space in my pack was at a premium. So many things were more important than these small mementos. At times, I'd read them to try to justify those years. I was never successful. The years seemed like such a waste of my few talents and of my last remaining years of youth. Tonight, though, I couldn't concentrate on what I wanted to write. I couldn't do anything more than flip through the well-worn pages. I wasn't seeing the words. My vision fuzzy because of the tears I couldn't stop. 
For some reason, what that waitress said stuck in my mind. He cares. Why should this God care about me? I hadn't stopped to give much thought to who or what a God might be, but I was sure that if there was one, he wouldn't care about me. There was way too much water under that bridge. When I was younger, I remember only going to church at Christmas. To go to midnight mass with my very elderly grandmother was like a treat. It was the only time she would come anywhere near our house. I'd sit and wait by the front window, my small nose pressed against the glass, waiting with eager anticipation to see her old car pull up out front, because she wouldn't come in. I had to run out to her. She wouldn't even leave her car. In fact, that was the only time I ever saw her, those trips to Mass, until the year I sat and waited, but she never came. Finally, my father said she wasn't going to be coming again because she had died months earlier. Without a word, I went to my room and changed out of my dress. Feeling nothing for this woman who had left me without a word of goodbye didn't seem out of place in my strange world. Odd that my father had said nothing earlier, but I guess it was another way for him to torment me. In those years that my grandmother and I went to midnight mass, I'd followed behind her heavy thumps echoing as she hobbled into the church, leaning hard on her cane. It was where I'd enter a special, magical world for one brief, enchanted moment in time. Too bad it couldn't have lasted more than that one night a year. I never understood a word that was said at the service. But you didn't need words to understand what was special in a child's mind. You simply needed to view the place as only a child could. The way the candlelight danced around that darkened cathedral made the trip worthwhile. All the gold and silver trinkets placed in the niches sparkled. The giant crystal chandelier hanging in the center of the room came alive. The faces of the porcelain statues softened and became real. If you were a child, it was a fantasy world come true. Magically, everything there understood it was Christmas, and a time for happiness, joy, otherworldliness. There, for a few moments, I'd forget the tortures of life. Abuse was an everyday occurrence with my alcoholic parents. My first suicide attempt was at the age of ten. But here, in this special mass, I get lost in the fantasy world of warmth and light. It gave me the energy to get through a few more days of anguish. But that wasn't God. That was just warm fuzzies, a feeling that faded as soon as Christmas was over and real life came crashing back in. Now that I was an adult, I'd put aside silly fantasies like midnight mass. I knew better than to believe that there was a God. I knew there was no Savior in this world. Shaking off these thoughts, I realized how long of a day it had been and how bone-weary I was. Time to get some sleep, because somehow things always seemed to look brighter in the morning. As usual, I tried my best to snuggle into my thread-worn blanket. Warmth was a luxury I was used to not having. You know you've gone too far from normal when being warm is rare. When one word from a stranger brings back a grandmother who's been dead for almost 30 years. When your days were all filled with nothing, because that was all you had. Sleep for me was usually elusive when I was in this kind of pensive mood, yet somehow that night a deep, sweet slumber overcame me as soon as I lay down. I don't even think my spot was what most people would call comfortable, but somehow I was beyond noticing, beyond caring. In my heart, I knew I'd come to the end of everything. Life was wasted on me. I knew that I'd make only one last journey. Back to where it all began, though I wasn't sure why I felt the need to finally go home. I hadn't been home since I started this journey, but now I knew I had to. Tomorrow, I would begin my long journey home.
You're listening to Big World Network. Music by Kevin McLeod.